Panowie, udałoby się jeszcze raz na
Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your patience. We needed a few more minutes in order to let the commissioner talk to the media. Since this is a citizen's dialogue, not, he's not talking only to us, but also to people uh, listening to radio stations and TV stations. Uh, welcome to the first citizen's dialogue at Politica Insight. We are extremely proud and happy to be hosting it today. For those of you who don't know Politica Insight, we are the leading provider of political and economic analysis in Poland, uh, giving strategic awareness to decision makers, not only here in Poland, but also abroad, in, including the European Commission, uh, who is, who is uh, drawing on our analysis to better understand what's happening in Poland. But today we are gathered for a citizen's dialogue. So the idea is not to talk between decision makers, but really to make the decision maker talk to us, citizens of Poland, uh, about the current challenges that Europe is facing, about the current challenges that Polish EU relations are facing, and in particular about the issue which is topping the agenda in Brussels and also to some extent in Poland, which is the future post-2020 EU budget. We are extremely happy to be hosting today Mr. Günther Oettinger, the Commissioner for Budget and Human Resources, who has been a guest at our yearly conference last year, and he delivered the closing remarks on the future of the European Union. Uh, we are extremely glad that you are here and you found time on your busy agenda in Warsaw, which included talks to the Prime Minister and to members of Parliament uh, to do also a meeting uh, with Polish citizens. Uh, uh, before I invite the Commissioner to, to take the floor, I wanted just to indicate that uh, the remarks that the Commissioner will be delivering will be delivered in German. So if you need translation, the sets are behind you. Uh, so you can you can better follow uh, the remarks, Commissioner. A very warm welcome to you. Thank you for coming. And uh, do you want to take podium? Yeah. Dear host, dear ladies and gentlemen, thank you for inviting me. It's the end of our two-day agenda, and I'm happy to be here. Sorry we are late, but um, we have been in the same in Senate and. Now we had a press point and it was not so easy to uh, finish uh, the press point without any question. Indeed, we are preparing a next multi-annual financial uh, framework. But before we have to see what is the future of Europe, what citizens, you, member states, members of European Parliament, I see a former member of the European Parliament coming from Poland and having worked together with me uh, in energy um, policies, what do we expect from our European Union? Is there uh, added value working together, investing together, developing European projects, and to be maybe more efficient to activate added value? We have heute neue Aufgaben, die by the Beratung des letzten Haushaltsrahmens. During the consultations on the last uh, multiannual financial framework, those challenges were not so much known and um, they were not so huge. Migration, the refugee crisis. And in particular, the task to fight terrorism together. Also, describing the situation as one in which Europe is surrounded by um, unstable countries ruled by autocrats. Um, well, such uh, Europe needs uh, to work better together, needs to invest more, because uh, America first means uh, Europe second or Europe nothing. That is why I have um, undertaken the task to um, present a financial framework where there will be no projects, no investments uh, without value added. But on the other hand, it also means that if we're able to prove the uh, value added, member states are expected to be ready to finance that value added, those new tasks. 
we will undertake those new tasks together in our European team among all European member states also as part of the um, Polish government's policy and the the other way around um, multi-annual um, programs will remain important and they will not become old-fashioned common agricultural policy the cohesion policy will remain important we have talked about this in all the fora with our partners and we have pointed that out however we do have the following problem if we would like to finance new tasks by cutting funds for the old tasks the previous tasks we will be facing um, a battle migration against cohesion cap against defense this would lead to divisions in Europe and we must avoid it. On the other hand, we will have another loophole related to, to Brexit. After a transitional period, we will have to phase the gap when where British contributions disappear from the uh, European budget, we will have a gap amounting to 12 to 13 billion euros year on year. So with such a point of departure, we are right now finalizing um, the development of um, the multi-annual financial uh, framework um, for the next seven years until 2027. Um, we also have another problem. In normal circumstances, democracy needs a majority, majority rule. It's not easy to gain such a majority, ladies and gentlemen. Creating the government and appointing the chancellor in Germany has shown us precisely that recently. But while approving the multi-annual financial framework in the EU, we need all the 27 ministers in the European Council and in the General Council to be unanimous. Also, the national parliaments need to be unanimous and there needs to be a majority in the European Parliament. If we would like to reach such a unanimity, we need to have a wise and balanced proposal, a reasonable budget that will take account of all the priorities of the member states as well as their willingness to compromise. On the other hand, we all need to prove our readiness to reach a compromise. Why do we need a seven-year multi-annual framework or a seven-year budget? Because we've got uh, long-term actions. For instance, if We'd like to fund Via Baltica or Rail Baltic, which is a state-of-the-art rail connection along the eastern coast of the Baltic Sea, starting from Finland um, and ending in Poland. We need tenders, uh, public procurement. Um, this will last for seven years, but these countries We'll only be able to start the construction if the whole of the funding and the co-funding on the part of Europe will be assured and not just one installment per year. For example, in Lithuania, the biggest project they have there is dismantling uh, the obsolete old nuclear plant, Soviet technology, and getting rid of the pollution. Our friends in Lithuania will be able to do it if they receive support from the European budget until 2027 or even later. Or microelectronics, nanoelectronics. Uh, we are preparing investment in um, the computers of the future, robotics, uh, all of this together with the European industry. The industry wants to know, wants us to tell them uh, already now if we will continue to be their partners in the next decade, whether um, we will be funding those projects in the years uh, to come. 
um, regions and mayors, they've got their projects uh, to implement, and they would like to know already know whether they will be able to do that in the next five to seven years and not just in one particular budget year. Or young farmers who are taking over the farm from their parents who'd like to continue to work there, who like to grow their farms, uh, introduce uh, new technologies, who'd like to take over their neighbor's farm as well, and who'd like to invest in um, milk, cows, and biomass at the same time, need uh, two to three million to do that. And they only have 10% in cash. So this person, this young farmer, will need a father who will give him a banking guarantee or a bank. And the bank will measure their credit worthiness according to their qualifications, but also, or even to a much greater extent, according uh, to the fact whether direct payments for that farm uh, will be part of the European budget uh, for the next seven years. So that's why we need the budget not for just one or two years, but seven to ten years. That's uh, why now on the 2nd of May we will present um, the multiannual financial framework. Our aim is to have a budget, a, a draft budget, um, acceptable for all, so that by Easter next year, among the 27 EU member states and in the European Parliament, we could um, reach a consensus. So I'd like to listen to your questions, because that's why we have this uh, citizens' uh, dialogue. I'd like to thank the organizers very much. I'd like to thank Politica Inside, who is a truly wonderful partner. So this event is being broadcast on the internet. So all questions you're we asking, you'll be asking actually uh, in public. Uh, we have about uh, 40 minutes to go, um, so I don't want to occupy too much time. Do prepare your questions. I'll just start off, kick off the discussion with one initial question uh, regarding, I'll switch to German now in order to, uh, to facilitate. Ich wollte Sie kurz zu der Einstellung der Kommission I would like to ask you to briefly present the commission, uh, the commission stance on the rule of law. The Polish government um, proposed a compromise last week. Many people and more so are um, curious about the attitude of the European Commission or the expectations of the European Commission um, in the context of those, those changes in the Polish law. Is that enough to reach a compromise between Brussels or Warsaw or will there be more negotiations? A few days ago, we received some explanations from the Polish government. At the moment, they are um, analyzed by the legal services in um, the cabinets of uh, Franz Timmermans and Jean-Claude Juncker. This will not take several months, but um, definitely by mid April, we will see the results of the evaluations and we will be able to tell you whether our legal expectations, legal requirements have been met. And if uh, we uh, can embark on the final uh, talks with the Polish government, so please give us several more weeks of time to give you an answer to this question on the um, multi-annual financial framework and uh, the rule of law. There are several expectations on the part of the Parliament and uh, Member States. There is an orientation debate um, in the Commission in the third week of April, and that is when we will take the decision whether for our financial programs there will be some conditions, additional conditions, or whether um, that will only be restricted to macroeconomic conditions. Start the dialogue. Is there anybody who would like to, to start? A I see there is a colleague in the back. Uh, 
Good afternoon, Commissioner. I'm Joanna Popilaska from Politica Insight. Uh, so, uh, um, I, I, I wanted to ask a question about what you just said, the conditionality connected to the rule of law. We know that the Commission is uh, trying to figure out how, how it could work. Uh, could you maybe tell us a little bit more? And uh, if you're not afraid that this uh, new conditionality could actually harm you know, the ordinary beneficiaries of uh, EU fund, uh, funds, uh, how do you want to go about it? Thank you. Ich will vorausschicken, es geht nicht um eine Lex Polen, sondern es geht um die Frage, die wir generell besprechen müssen. It's not only about the Polish issue, it's about the general issue related to the rule of law and the role it plays in our European reality and European work. It is also related to the candidates of the XF for the accession. And uh, as the European Union, if we want to be uh, 28 uh, uh, role models, we should practice the rule of law, something that we talk about. Let's uh, remember that Turkey is also a candidate country. Uh, the Western Balkans, we see the um, improvements there, but not all conditions to become EU member state uh, have been fulfilled. When it comes to macroeconomic uh, issues, if a given country would uh, infringe uh, significantly the rule of uh, law and the, the independence of courts would not be ensured in such a member states, if we were actually to finance the, any projects from the European funds, the would um, may appear a dispute whether the funds have been allocated and used properly. There could be a um, dispute in a court over the funds, funds that we allocate and control. We should think, therefore, whether we should decide, it should be decided by the court, uh, what to do in order to follow the principles of rule of law. Therefore, it's very important that uh, the courts are independent. Uh, courts cannot depend on the third parties. There are, of course, certain divisions of powers, uh, separation of powers, uh, ju uh, judicial, legislative, uh, uh, powers uh, should be separated, and it's not about uh, punishment, uh, penalizing anyone. We just want to ensure that the support uh, coming from the European budget, the money from the uh, EU taxpayers are properly used. So if there is a dispute over the funds, uh, uh, such dispute should be decided by the independent court whether the money should be refunded or returned to the EU budget, budget or not. Commissioner, it was a really great pleasure to work with you in the um, Energy Committee in the Parliament because of your very pro-European approach to energy issues. Um, I want to ask you, because today we face an extraordinary situation where 14 countries has expelled so-called Russian diplomats from their territories. I'm curious, how do you think this will influence uh, energy policy if whatever <coughs> of Russia, gas policy, uh, of course they will expel uh, diplomats, but I'm thinking about further, uh, further reaction actions and uh, how will generally this influence the EU, Russia, Thank you. Um, the Russian Federation and the European Union are direct neighbors. Um, we are living on the same continent. Say we are uh, in a close relationship. Um, we are concerned about the development between uh, Russia and Ukraine about what happened in, in Crimea, uh, in the Donbass region. Uh, 
we are concerned that maybe uh, the Russian Federation is hoping that Ukraine is a failed state, and they are doing a lot for to realize uh, this kind of a negative vision. We are doing a lot for to stabilize uh, Ukraine, democracy, reforms, um, uh, their market-based economies, investments, and so on. And energy is playing an important role. Uh, for me, at times, it was clear that energy and deliveries, supply, should be beyond politics. Um, should not be used or misused as a political instrument. And looking back last years, um, we had um, relation which have been stable. Um, it's mainly about gas, but it's about oil as well. It's about electricity, seeing the Baltic states. So we are checking the situation day by day. Um, and I would say to ask diplomats to come back is a typical diplomatic reaction. It's not new and not surprising. It's nearly a must. It's, nearly, it's normal. And to be in a close partnership here with our British colleagues, when at the same time we are negotiating Brexit, I think is a good sign of solidarity. Um, but uh, if I would be asked what's about energy, I would say, please hold energy supply out of this development. It should not be Europe who is starting to use energy as a political instrument. On the other hand, hmm, I think these days are not perfect days for Nord Stream 2 pioneers. My concerns or my distance to Nord Stream 2 is more and more uh, stabilized. Uh, so I think we shouldn't deepen our relationship and so dependence from Russian sources. Uh, diversification, as we certain times developed, of routes and sources, diversification should be a, um, a primary EU um, ambition. There's a gentleman in the back here. Vielleicht in, in Deutsch dann die Fragen. Also zwei kurze Fragen. I will ask two questions in uh, German, two very important questions. First of all, the Polish government, uh, when it talks about the rule of laws, uh, also uh, recall the German situation where the German uh, politicians have the right to appoint uh, the uh, judges. So you uh, had also impacted the situation. So what is your uh, view on this uh, situation in Poland? Another question relates to a scandal, uh, the uh, questions on all the situation with Facebook. The citizens who elect authorities, elect politicians as well. They also have the right actually to get protected and shouldn't be manipulated by some uh, information coming from the third parties. What do you think about it? Is it a national issue or international one? So let me first take your second question. In Germany, when it comes to the uh, situation with courts, civil courts, uh, administrative courts, or penal courts, criminal courts, it's just a question of the uh, federations. Uh, 
and uh, land-related issues. The Constitutional Tribunal has uh, its powers at the federal level as well. We have some uh, judge committees, whereas the Minister of Justice is only appointing judges or um, handing and the nominations. When it comes to the administrative court, is actually closer to the world of politics. Bundesrat and Bundestag, the both uh, chambers responsible for uh, appointment of judges uh, at this level have to follow clear rules, whereas when it comes to, to uh, s uh, Christian Democrats, I am actually a Christian Democrat, I have to say that it, would, it wouldn't be possible without uh, SPD. We uh, appointed judges jointly together. Uh, there were liberal, uh, liberals uh, and the uh, Green Party also helping us uh, in this nomination. So, of course, uh, well, now when it comes to the second question, uh, when we talk about this big platform, there is a need for a regulation. I'm talking here about uh, Google or uh, Facebook. Uh, they definitely have to follow specific rules. We have to regulate um, the activities. Therefore, I'm uh, so glad to have the uh, the European law on the personal data protection it will come into force in eight weeks. Uh, we need this law as uh, the national laws no longer uh, accept uh, the American uh, rules. We need to, for, uh, to have uh, a better authority to protect the personal data of the European citizens. Uh, this can be ensured uh, only in the digital when sometimes I follow my son, what he uh, is posting on Facebook, important, less important issues, uh, uh, posting uh, pictures from holidays, uh, pictures uh, from some personal uh, personal pictures as well. I was asking, I'm uh, asking him why you need to share everything with everyone. You don't have to communicate uh, everyone uh, things that bother you. Less is more. Uh, data protection means that uh, ourselves we should not use uh, our personal data in a wrong way. I told my son, if uh, you turn 30 and you will try to apply for a job, your uh, boss-to-be will not only look uh, at your school certificate, uh, he will also check, he check your posts uh, on the social media what things you shared there. Facebook is a public uh, platform. Therefore, when it comes to the protection of personal data, is uh, our personal matter as well. It's also the uh, our obligation, it's obligation of powers, vis -vis parents vis-a-vis -vis their children. On the other hand, the fact that Facebook makes the personal data available, makes this data on the citizens' preferences, uh, customs, uh, judgments, prejudices, etc. The fact that it is selling this information, making business on that, that's appalling. I have read a week ago that uh, um, people were manipulated uh, before the Brexit um, uh, um, referendum. Uh, of course, uh, referendum is a legitimate uh, issue, but no matter what referendum you talk about, it cannot be manipulated uh, by the fact of uh, misuse of the personal data. Therefore, we have to be protected against such cases, and now we are facing this general issue, how we want to regulate and control uh, more and more uh, important social media. There is yet another level of this protection. The social media 
share very information to serve certain preferences. In such reality, we are not going to have the uh, coherent society. We just uh, service some ex social expectations and it will just trigger some uh, divisions in the society instead of support that's integrity. So, I would say that we should rather select the information that has to be published on the social media. Łukasz Domagała, National Federation of Polish Civil Society Organization. I would back to the first question. And uh, we know that we have some problems with democracy in Poland, but not only in Poland, but the uh, European countries and the, the European Union promote these values as a democratic values outside Europe. Uh, as, a, as a union, as, as, uh, as a single country in, in foreign policy. Maybe it is time now we have insight tool to promote these values from Article 1. Insight in Europe, prepared by the Commission to, for example, civil societies institutions. Thank you. What was the question? What, what do you think about this new tool for, to, to, to promote the democracy values and to, to promote values from Article, uh, t, uh, from Article 2 from the Treaty Inside Europe? Via NGOs, yes? Unsere yeah. Werteordnung ist klar. Die ist für uns eine Verpflichtung. Our values are quite clear. This is our obligation, and we, as the European Commission, we have to do our best in order to promote them through education, transparency, kind of guidelines uh, uh, elaborated for the European member states in order to stabilize the situation. Therefore, uh, democratic parliaments or the parliaments uh, voted uh, in a democratic, democratic way, uh, NGOs, they have to play a significant role. Therefore, in our budget, we have allocated much more funds to support, to promote such initiatives. So we allocate as the EU more than the individual member states. So environmental goals, uh, energy-related issues, NGOs working for integration, social inclusion. Uh, NGOs who care for a certain vision of human beings, certain values. I believe we don't need any new tool. We have uh, enough of, uh, flexibility to decide based on a given um, proposal of the NGO, whether a given project or activity or education uh, activity makes sense and whether it is possible to support it using European funds. Thank you. My name is Janusz Turski. I'm from the one of the energy intensive industrial pulp and paper sector in Poland. I'm keen to learn from you how do you see the European industry sectors to match your next financial perspective having to do with this common architectural policy, some other new uh, challenges ahead of us like uh, external and internal EU security and migration problem. Where is this famous renaissance for the industry that was a manifesto announced four years ago? How do you go with the new budget perspective having in mind the industry and its competition at the global level. Thank you. Industrial products and industrial production in general has to be a stable partner seeing our whole 
value chain. So we need a clear strategy for to hold industries, uh, if feasible, all industrial sectors inside our EU, and to reduce our dependence on imports. Um, seeing China and the Made in China 2025 strategy, seeing how the US has decreased taxation for um, industrial uh, profits and investment. We have to be concerned. Uh, since years, we are asking for 20% of our GDP coming from industrial um, production. And we are losing uh, year by year some uh, parts of a, per of a percent. Um, and mainly member states as Italy, France lost a lot. One reason why Germany is so strong is industry, products made in Germany. Cars, trucks, electrotechnical products and tools, chemical industries, and so on. And paper is one important sector. And here, what is the main um, point? For to stay or to go, it's energy. It's electricity. The uh, paper industry in Germany is more or less down. Because uh, electricity is uh, from um, solar and wind not really competitive. And energy prices are too high. So let me say, from the beginning, I'm convinced we need more industrial production. And for member states as Slovakia, Czech Republic, Hungary, Poland, Romania, it's so important. So I will do my best for to support you and Polish and uh, Central and Eastern European uh, member states' policies for to stabilize industry. And to have good reasons for to get investments in all industrial sectors. First a question from Mrs. gashuk Pihovic and then from Professor, Professor Kleiber. My name is Kamila gashuk Pihovic. I'm a member of the Polish Parliament, uh, one of the opposition party, Nowoczesna. And I have two short questions. One is uh, related to the budget. After Brexit, the gap in the EU revenue uh, will be around 13 billion. And to what extent could it be covered by the additional uh, payments, uh, increased contribution from the member states. Uh, as far as I know, uh, some of them already expressed they will, they careful intention to do such bigger uh, contribution. And the other question uh, is related to the Polish judiciary system. Um, as far as I understand, the uh, politics influence, I, I, in, uh, influence on the judiciary system in German uh, is built in accordance to German constitution. And the problem in Poland we have in that way that um, the governing party is building the solutions related to the judiciary system not in accordance Dance to Polish constitution. We have the state um, uh, state judiciary council, which should be independent from influence on politics, uh, and it is the way of appointing the judges in Poland. Um, and my question is. Uh, uh, one of the key principles in European Union is the rule of uh, equal access to the uh, funds for all potential beneficiaries, which is, to be honest, difficult to ensure without indep independent courts. So my question is, is the Commission consider considering any additional uh, safeguards to ensure this principle uh, is really fulfilled? 
And would it be possible to address this issue in such way, in such way that the funds, funds are still available to normal citizens, to regions, um, so that they do not pay the price for the misbehavior of the government, of the ruling party, etc.? Die Brexit-Lücke müssen wir schließen, weil im Gegensatz zu Mitgliedstaaten und Kommunen haben wir kein Recht äh, auf um, die Citizens von den Member States und uh, den Regionen. Wir haben nicht das Recht, die Schulden Wir können nicht die Lücke in den Finanzen schließen. Uh, Loans by credits. Now let's look at the um, expectations of uh, the member states. Some countries do not want any cuts in cohesion or in the support for agriculture. Other countries do not want to pay higher contributions. Let me tell you that everyone needs to be able uh, to reach a compromise. And this goes um, for Ireland in terms of agriculture. It's true for Poland in terms of cohesion. And um, it uh, concerns the Netherlands, uh, Denmark and Austria in terms of their readiness to pay more contributions. If not everyone is uh, prepared to reach a compromise, we will never have a unanimous result. Nevertheless, I'm still an optimism, uh, optimist and I think that... MFF would be the worst solution. Well, we will still have uh, multi-annual financial frameworks. Um, this would, if we didn't have it, it would be the worst possible solution, no matter if you are the net contributor or uh, you are uh, the prime beneficiary of the European funds. The European Commission has um, the duty to oversee not just one particular country, but all of them to see whether uh, their political and legal situation is in line with European treaties. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I've been doing this for eight years. The services of the European Commission uh, are not blind only in one eye. We verify wherever there are complaints. There is a reason uh, to verify something where we have been called to audit um, to the west and to the east and the big member states and the new member states. Uh, we need to be impartial. We are the guardians of the treaty. In recent years, I've never had a reason to suspect that we are unilateral. It's true, I was born in Germany, but I must admit that most infringement um, cases concerned Germany. In fact, uh, ladies and gentlemen, no uh, member state uh, is completely right in what they do. The independence of the judiciary um, is an example. Uh, apart from Poland, uh, well, several years ago, the prime minister of Hungary formed a new government and then he, he got uh, irritated. He got mad at the judges who had been introduced uh, into the judiciary system by the previous government. He wanted to get rid of them. And then he came to the conclusion that uh, in, uh, he would simply uh, reduce the pensionable age. But he didn't want to send them off to retirement. He just wanted um, to be able to appoint many new judges in one go. And this was exactly an action against independence, uh, the independence of the judiciary. The pensionable age uh, cannot be arbitrarily reduced in order to replace um, the old judges with new ones. Um, second of all, it's also not right if someone says it's 64 for men and 62 for women, because it boils down to discrimination. The, my previous colleague, Vivian Redding, um, 
in the Barroso Commission also paid attention to this fact, and she prevented it. And at the end of the day, Viktor Orban had to give in. We've got numerous examples uh, when we admonish uh, the rule of law, when we um, um, force um, the rule of law to be respected. Michael, Michael Kleiber, I, I've got a, a, a few different functions, but one of them is the Vice President of the European Academy of Sciences and Arts. And Commissioner, uh, I have the following question. Based on your vast experience, uh, the needs on one hand and the opinion of different member states on the other, would you be for higher or lower European budget? Uh, explanation of my question goes as, as follows. Uh, I've been over years active in a number of different European bodies, also related to research and education. And uh, you are probably aware that, uh, that the, the budget for research, the European budget for research, is roughly 5% of the budget for research in all the member states combined. Which means uh, there is no common research area, even if European politicians the politicians actually declare uh, the, this uh, uh, unity uh, for, for years. And uh, uh, we have in Europe, because of our solid educational systems, because of, uh, of a very good uh, research infrastructure, because of very talented researchers, which we have in basically every European country, we are well positioned to be really competitive on the world uh, scene uh, in terms of, of, of research. But we are not. We are not for the simple reason that we have 28 member states and 28 different uh, uh, systems uh, for funding research. And uh, today research requires uh, uh, collaboration. And we are losing a, a, a chance to really work together. I think this is a symbolic, in a sense. So, so the question is, would you see a chance that we increase the budget perhaps the budget as such, the whole budget, but also uh, the budget for, for activities like, like research, because I think it's absolutely instrumental in terms of our dreams to improve the European competitiveness. Well, you know, if we invest more at the European level, it will be better for the taxpayer as well, because the investment will be more effective. If we take a look at the digital revolution, if we um, take a look at uh, the human resources uh, owned by the Silicon Valley, um, supported by billions uh, from the Pentagon. Uh, the Chinese are also investing huge sums of money there. We need to do more. We have had the objective of three years of GDP for many years to invest it in R&D. Uh, so far, we have reached 2%. I come from Baden-Württemberg, and um, um, that is the only uh, reason for me to be proud. We've got 4.9% in Stuttgart uh, of our GDP that goes to R&D, 2% in the EU, and well, the, in Italy, only 1%, only 1% goes to R&D. 3% in the EU of 28 member states would mean 54 billion. In the horizon, we only have 12 billion. This means we've got a huge um, room for development. Uh, there are many projects that um, one member states cannot afford or a specific uh, company such as Bosch or Siemens. But a European team that is the member states together with the industry um, are strong enough and have got uh, enough human uh, reserves. Zum Schluss hätte ich noch eine Frage an Sie. Uh, wir müssen uh den Kommissar Zeit gewähren, damit er seinen Flug nicht verpasst. Aber ich habe eine Frage an Sie. Äh
Uh, Mr. Commissioner, I have one question just to conclude. I know you're responsible for the budget, and I know that uh, the biggest uh, problem with Poland is a question of the rule of law here. I have the following question, therefore. When you follow the sentiments, can you say that the EU Commission is more focused on guaranteeing the independence of judiciary in Poland, or uh, they rather focus on the individual judges and their independence? Because the worry that we have is that when the well, the change of legislation adopted last year would lead to a situation where this uh, system would be uh, dismantled in a way. Of course, they ha we have to bear in mind both factors, the daily practice as well as uh, certain rules and the uh, primary and secondary law. We run a very intense dialogue. We will continue uh, here when it comes to our approach to this issue, to this dialogue. I'd say that in the recent months, we achieved a significant improvement. Now, the question uh, whether it is sufficient or not, uh, well, this information will be provided by Mr. Timmermans. Thank you. For, for, for coming to Warsaw. We will all be looking forward to the next EU budget uh, and to the conundrums which the Commission will be facing around mm -hmm. issues of conditionality, rule of law, and money flowing from uh, net, uh, net payers to actually net beneficiaries in EU. This is the moment when we are closing the Citizens' Dialogue. Thank you very much for your participation and thank you to all the citizens who have been participating in the debate via, via our internet link. Thank you.